Welcome to Kingdoms in Conflict. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Wallace. In the last few months, the world has been fighting the coronavirus, a deadly virus that has spread worldwide. However, there is an ideology just as dangerous and potentially lethal to our society, critical race theory. What is critical race theory? And how is it changing our culture? Dr. Carol Swain, author, commentator, and former professor of political science and professor of law at Vanderbilt University, will be here to discuss critical race theory and its effect on our society. We will discuss this and more when we return. At Freedom's Journal Institute, we stand with those who are becoming marginalized simply because of their biblical faith and values. Like you, we are troubled by the racial and political unrest in our society. With the launch of our new online community, the Alliance of Freedom Fighters, we have risen to the challenge in the battle for life, liberty, and the pursuit of holiness. Go to allianceoffreedomfighters.com and become a part of the Alliance. Welcome to Kingdoms in Conflict. I want to thank you for joining us today, and we are especially privileged to have Dr. Carol Swain with us. Uh, how are you doing today? I am doing great, and it's such a privilege to be on your show. Well, thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us. Uh, you know, this is a Christian show, so every now and then I'll ask people to give, me a, give them a little bit of their testimony, because I know it, it kind of leads you into the whole critical race theory, which we're gonna, eventually going to get to, right? I can give you my story very quickly, but I have to start off my childhood. Okay. I was one of 12 children born and raised in rural poverty, southwestern Virginia. We all dropped out of school after they grad. I married at 16, had my first child at 17. By the time I was 21, I had three small children, uh, two people. One was a medical doctor and another one uh, was an orderly in a nursing home came into my life and they spoke uh, words that encouraged me. I Ended up getting a high school equivalency, going to a community college and getting the first of five degrees. And during this time, I was not uh, a uh, church goer, but I was always a spiritual person in that um, I just was. And I was not um, raised in the church, but my great grandfather had been a pastor and my grandmother used to teach us things. And I can remember being in a church program, but we were essentially unchurched. But I was always different, and I always felt like there was something I was supposed to do. I had this uneasy tension, very serious as a child. Um, my mother said I was not like any of her other children. And um, I ended up, you know, being steered into academia. And I would say today that God brought people in my life, and not all were believers that were significant, and I did not get saved until late in life, after I had been tenured at Princeton and um, went through a midlife crisis and a journey that uh, took me through New Age and Eastern religions, and I ended up, you know, being a spirit field, born again, all of those <laughs> things, Christian, and yeah. that happened late. It was 1999 before I understood fully the Christian message and that it was not about me, that my life belonged to Christ. And uh, I, I mean, it, it stuck. Like people saw me as a person that was, it was like, okay, you know, Carol is on to something new. When is, you know, you know, she'll be on to something different. Uh, I don't think they thought it would stick. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, that's excellent. 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 It's good to know your background. So at what point did you come in to our subject matter, come in contact with our subject matter? The, you know, critical, critical theory, race theory. Or, critical, or critical race theory. I was in college because I had children. I was very, very focused. So I didn't have time for foolishness or politics or I was not in the Black Student Union. I was in the honor societies, but I was always looking for what was going to help me get a good job. And when I was in college, I took the political theory course that I was required to take, but I was not interested in Marxism and uh, the critical race theory uh, in graduate school. I knew who the Marxist professors were. And then during my time at Princeton, Cornell West was there and 
various yeah. people and they were all talking about, you know, deconstructing things and, uh, and there was a more critical theory there. But again, I mean, I was a congressional scholar. I was focused on Congress. I was not interested what got me interested was around the time when President Obama got elected and, uh, and I started reading Saul Alinsky. And then there was a movie by Curtis Bowers. Um, I can't think of the name of it right now, but it was a documentary film. Mm -hmm. And I started to connect the dots to see how, I think it was Grinding Down America or something like that was might've been the name of the film. Um, how things were connected. And I started teaching courses at Vanderbilt on how communism had a, impacted American political thought. And that was late in my career. Mm -hmm. And um, and I saw just what I had missed. And, you know, like I'm, I'm of a mixed mind. Maybe if I'd been in graduate school and I had taken those courses, maybe I'd be in Mar a Marxist today. Uh, it turned out that in my undergraduate experience, I was always kind of conservative. I had uh, a conservative professor, white professor, that other students told me was a racist not to take his classes. Well, when people told me that, uh, then I was definitely going to take that classes. <laughs> Throw the gauntlet down. So I took his courses, and he had me reading Thomas Sowell, uh, wow. uh, Edward wow. Banfield, uh, mm -hmm. Walter Williams, and people like that. And, and so... I started, I'm still a Democrat most of my life and conservative. Uh, uh, no, I was, a, I was just not, I did not quite fit in, but I was a Democrat and I didn't, um, but I was not as liberal as everyone else around me and doing the angel explosion of the 1990s when there were all these books about, you know, sit down and chat with your angel, have coffee with your angel, talk to your angel. Um, mm -hmm. I remember one of my colleagues asking me, do you believe in angels? And I said something like, I'm, I'm undecided. Everyone's shocked because they, we don't believe in anything in academia but ourselves. <laughs> well, let me, uh, let, let me ask you this. <laughs> what's, what's the connection between critical theory and Marxism? Oh, well, the critical theory grows out of Marxism and um, it's not, uh, not out of economic Marxism. Uh, but out of cultural Marxism. And if you read the writings of the disciples of Karl Marx, mm -hmm. uh, when his revolution didn't take place, they were trying to figure out like what went wrong? Why didn't this happen? And uh, the argument, you know, uh, different ones of his students, uh, Antonio Gramsci, and um, they were not his direct students because he died in 1800. 1898 or something like that, right. but they were part of that Frankfurt school in Germany that fled Germany after the rise of Hitler and came to Columbia University and set up camp. But they looked at the culture of the U.S. and they believed that that Western uh, uh, framework or Western mentality, the Christianity and uh, the tra traditional values and institutions that they were a uh, barrier to the economic revolution. And Max Horkheimer was the one that developed critical theory. And out of critical theory, you get critical feminist theory, critical um, um, uh, race theory, and then uh, I guess critical LGBT theory. And so there are lots of critical theories, but they're all about um, reconstructing the society very much about uh, destroying existing structures so that new structures rise or, and they are uh, utopian. They believe that um, the society, the world is divided between oppressors and the oppressed and uh, the dominant group. And in the US, they would say it's white people, the dominant group and people of color are oppressed. And, um, and with the feminist theory, critical feminist theory, they would say that men, you know, are the oppressors and that women are the oppressed. And it's all about victimization. And it's a very uh, destructive uh, message because they are trying to dismantle and destroy existing uh, institutions. So the whole idea of deconstructing, you know, what's, what's here, uh, Western civilization, and then reconstructing something else in its place, right? And they're not so, very good builders. 
you know, and, you know, well, they're not. And the socialism that we see that uh, many young people in particular, they seem to think they're going to like socialism. And we know that everywhere it's been tried in the world, it has been a miserable failure, but they still say that things that have always been said over the decades, well, uh, the last time was tried, it wasn't done right. We're going to do it right. And the critical race theory uh, in the United States today, it's reached a dangerous level because uh, they have this whole cottage industry of diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion um, officers and deans and various individuals. And that's a layer on top of affirmative action. And in, and in my day, we had affirmative action, you know, that uh, uh, started in the late mid 1960s, late early 1970s, and it's been with us. And that was to bring about equal opportunity and non-discrimination. And uh, when I was getting my education and throughout my life, I have uh, wanted non-discrimination and equal opportunity. It's like, show me what to do and let me prove myself. Well, the critical race theorists argue that society is uh, racist to the core, it's permanent. You can't do right. anything about race, racism, that white people um, uh, have a property interest in their whiteness and uh, that they um, uh, have to divest themselves of whiteness by becoming consciously anti-racist. And it's set up in a way where blacks and people of color are always the victims and whites are superior. And it's led to ludicrous, ludicrous kind of things like college campuses. You think about the civil rights movement and how many people, you know, died for equal rights and they're right. resegregating college campuses by demand. And in my day, you know, we got into colleges and universities and we worked really hard to meet the standards that everyone else had to meet. Mm -hmm. And now we've been told that black children raised in privilege never had any segregated experiences except by choice that somehow they can't learn standard English, to me, that's racist. Right. How did this ideology, I want to call it a virus, but how did this ideology get into our school system? Um, I mean, because it's in our colleges, it's in uh, high schools now, it's in, and it's even in our churches. It's in it's, Christian uh, uh, academies, and it's very dangerous. It's ungodly uh, because it comes out of Marxism, and the thing about it is um, God word the Bible tells us everything we need to know about race and nations and how they interact with one another and and for the church to allow the secular world to tell them how to deal with race relations and for them to look at critical race theory I mean that's a surrender and a compromise and it's evil and destructive and it's not um uh, when you look at the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, mm -hmm. um, it's uh, we protect individual rights, and it's not right to uh, discriminate against a person or marginalize them or shame them because of the color of their skin, and that includes white people too. And so there's a level of discrimination and harassment and shaming taking place today in America that would not be tolerated if it were to be right. done against any other group than whites. Yeah, but we can't be racist against white people, right? That's what the, black, you know, black the people critical can't be race racist. theorists would argue because they would say that black people have to, you would have to have power and people of color don't have power. And that doesn't make any sense because we've had a black president that was elected to two terms, as well as two black attorney generals, as well as the Congressional Black Caucus and numerous black leaders in the political, uh, as well as the corporate world mm -hmm. and uh, black people in positions of authority all over America and they can oppress and they can discriminate and anyone that buys that, uh, that you can't be racist because you're a person of color, then um, you're very misguided. And another problem too is that this critical race theory argues that the learned experiences of people of color, this doesn't apply if you're conservative or you're Christian, that somehow these trump reality and facts that what I say because I'm a person of color that's marginalized, that is supposed to have more weight and authority than anyone else in the room. 
it has more authority over facts. My experience, right. regardless of what it is, has more authority, even, even over the facts that you're looking at, the data that you have in your hand. Uh, well, I've had uh, white, uh, heard white uh, liberals, I mean, this is a chance that they really get to show their racism, argue that when a black person interprets a regression or, or equation that uh, it's different than when a white person does. And even with math, wow. they have started to uh, make math subject to whatever people think it is. So if I'm a person of color and I say two plus two equals six, then uh, if I say it's six, uh, it, my moral, because I have moral authority that's connected to my skin color, uh, then that's what it is because that's what it is to me. Wow, that's, that's ridiculous. I don't, I, don't, I don't understand this. And so a well, lot there's of this- a scripture in Corinthians that I can't quote about the foolish, the, um, how God takes the wisdom of the world, how foolish it is. And, right, and he right. gives people over to their own foolishness and that's what's happening. And a lot of this stuff, as it infiltrated our, correct me if I'm wrong, as it infiltrated our colleges, campuses, and everything else, this is what helps give movements like BLM, Black Lives Matter, um, a lot of, uh, what should I say, uh, a lot of fuel, if you will, because it's already, the foundation has already been laid, right? Well, they uh, have a moral legitimacy that they should not have. And uh, it's because most Americans are not critical thinkers and they can't separate a slogan, Black Lives Matter. And, right. and I would say white lives matter, all lives matter, life matters. They can't separate a true statement from an organization that's Marxist and really much uh, focused on destroying America as we know it and being led by people that are not people of color, people that are using people of color uh, uh, to overthrow existing structures. So they have their agenda, they're clear about what they're doing and, um, and people are getting behind them. And another thing I find very troubling is if you uh, look at those cases like George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, uh, there was a time when uh, with Breonna Taylor, if you actually look at uh, her life and the situation she's been in, and some of those situations people are not even aware of unless they just sort out the information. There was a time when you would tell your children, that's an example of you shouldn't hang out with the wrong kinds of people, that right, right. this is what happened to you when you hang out with the wrong kinds of people. Uh, that's not the lesson that Black America is getting from uh, her death. And then with George Floyd, um, the autopsies that showed uh, the, the level of drugs, illicit drugs in his system, enough mm -hmm. to kill a man. Uh, there's a lesson there about drug use. Uh, they're not getting the lessons. And again and again, I see uh, black people rally around people uh, who uh, have unfortunate conflicts with the police, but many of them are criminal. They have criminal records. And right. the lesson uh, shouldn't be that police don't have the authority to apprehend someone. It, it, I told my sons when I was raising them to be respectful to authority, and that meant the teacher as well as the police officer that stops them. And if they felt like they were being stopped unjustly, we would deal with it. I get a lawyer, we'll deal with it when you get home. But it's not uh, something you know that you would resist the authority and you would challenge the police officer or you would run from the police officer. One more thing before we have to go down our last few minutes. I wanted to ask you about systemic racism. I always talk about systemic racism. Or systemic racism is keeping black people back and everything else. And I know you're a lawyer, so you know that, you know. Well, it, I have it, a it, law it, degree, it, but I'm, I'm not a, an attorney with that. Oh, okay, well, but you. I can tell you about systemic racism. Okay. I was born in 1954, and that was the year of the Brown versus Board of Education. And during that time, black kids could not go to school with white kids. And so I grew up and I saw the 1964 Civil Rights Act pass that desegregated uh, accommodations. And I saw the Voting Rights Act and I saw our nation uh, remove those institutional barriers that led to discrimination. That was systemic racism. Uh, what they're complaining about today is not systemic racism. You can call it what you want, but for every time my race has uh, disadvantaged me, I would say that I gained more advantages being a bright black student 
in a society where a lot of people wanted me to be successful and they encouraged me and walked alongside me, I would say my race has advantaged me um, more than it has disadvantaged me. And every time I've had an encounter with a police officer, um, it was deserved. And, and a lot of, there are many tickets I should have gotten that I didn't get. <laughs> uh, and so uh, this systemic racism, I think it's unfortunate that young people uh, today would say that that's an excuse for failure. I live through systemic racism. I know about systemic racism, and this ain't it. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, that's, that's a perfect place for us to end. I want to thank you for being with us. Uh, time goes by so quickly uh, when we're talking about these issues, and we're going to have to have you back on again at some point. Uh, but thank you, uh, Dr. Thank Swain. You. It's, a it's a privilege talking to you, and uh, for those watching, we'll be back in just a minute. Never before in America's history has there been a more desperate need for a unified voice to fight against the moral decay of our nation. Liberal progressives are pushing an agenda to destroy Judeo-Christian values, and mainstream media and other institutions are promoting the depravity of our nation. At Freedom's Journal Institute, we stand with those who are becoming marginalized simply because of their biblical faith and values. Like you, we are troubled by the racial and political unrest in our society. With the launch of our new online community, the Alliance of Freedom Fighters, we have risen to the challenge in the battle for life, liberty, and the pursuit of holiness. When you join our community, you will get access to FJI's digital libraries and information sharing portals, the ability to collaborate with other Alliance Freedom Fighters on both national and local community projects and issues as well as needed support, encouragement, and best practices to champion our shared ideas and values. Go to allianceoffreedomfighters.com and become a part of the Alliance. Welcome back. It's interesting how a lie can twist the truth. Critical race theory is correct when it proponents state that race is a social construct not grounded in biology. This idea is only partially accurate. The falsehood is that humans can be divided into different races when there is only one race, the human race, in actuality. Race still exists socially and biologically, but not how secularists understand it. Another era of critical race theory is that all white people use race to oppress people of color for their own benefit. And this is evident in white supremacy and systemic racism. Thus, white people are hopelessly infected with the virus of racism that can't be cured. <clears throat> All these ideas fly in the face of biblical worldview. As we noted in different interview with Dr. John West, Darwinism laid the foundation for the notion that individual races were more advanced than others. Darwin's theories would eventually lead to eugenics movement that believed that society would be better off if we encourage the mating or the breeding of more laudable traits in humans and discourage the mating of those with undesirable traits, even to the point of extermination. We spoke of this as scientific racism. It fueled the idea that some races were superior to others. As we've said, racism or racial superiority is antithetical to biblical teaching. The book of Genesis only states that God created humans in his image and likeness and divided them into male and female. These are the only distinctions made. There is no distinction about features such as skin color, hair texture, or any other traits. It's not until we get to the story of Noah in Genesis 10 where the Bible writer begins to distinguish groups by their clans, their languages, their lands, and their nations, Genesis 10, 31, that these groups spread out after the flood in verse 32. Chapter 11 shows how and why people are divided into different clans, languages, lands, and nations. The Tower of Babel story states that God brought judgment on those who gathered in Shinar's plain who wanted to build a city with a tower to heaven in verse 4. Their ultimate goal was to make a name for themselves and to keep from being dispersed over the earth. Again, humans were trying to decide what was good apart from any input from God. They would make a name for themselves and stay in a particular geographical area. Yet God told humanity to be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth. They were supposed to populate the planet with other human beings, and they were not allowed to make a name for themselves. God does that. 
And in Genesis 12, God would choose a man for whom he says, quote, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing, end quote. Verse 2, God controls humanity's destiny. He made people different and divided into clans, languages, lands, and nations. He chose one man, Abraham, to create another nation that would eventually birth the Messiah. And it is God who will make Abraham's name great, not Abraham. Our differences are by divine order. And the Apostle Paul explains this at Athens when he says in Acts 17, 24 through 27, quote, The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Paul sums up the first 11 chapters of Genesis, at least in regards to our origins. Thus, as Paul preaches the gospel across the Gentile world, he can say in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, quote, for in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit, end quote. He will continue to talk about the many different parts of the body of Christ, but only one body and its features working together. In Romans chapter 3, Paul talks about God's righteousness, that God's righteousness is manifest apart from the law. In these verses, the universality of salvation and sin are found here in verses 20 through 2 through 25. Quote, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith that was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins, end quote. In other words, everyone of every ethnic group clan, language, and nation is guilty before God. However, everyone who believes in Jesus Christ is justified by grace through the redemption of Jesus. The Christian gospel knows of no sin except unbelief that cannot be forgiven or no person who cannot be redeemed. Critical race theory thus challenges the integrity of the gospel and needs to be rejected by the church without question. As Paul reminds us in Galatians 3.28, quote, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free. There is no male or female, for you are one in Christ Jesus, end quote. And if Paul were here today, he'd add, neither white nor black. Until next time, God bless.